Light passes through transparent materials. Its energy transferred through a electromagnetic wave, which is generated by vibrating atoms in materials. If light falls on matter, some of the electrons are forced to vibrate. The way a material behaves, for example its color, depends on its natural frequency of vibration. The natural frequency of visible light is about 10 to the power of 14 Hz. To be able to react on this frequency of vibration, there should be very little inertia. Electrons have little enough inertia to vibrate. The natural frequency of vibration of electrons depends on how well it's connected to the mother atom. Electrons in glass have a natural frequency of vibration in the ultraviolet area. If ultraviolet light hits the glass, the electrons in the glass go into resonance and then maintain a large amplitude of vibration. It keeps the energy for a certain while before moving to corresponding electrons. The energy ultimately becomes internal energy in the matter and then heats it up. The energy changes form into heat energy. And we can say that the glass is opaque to ultraviolet light because of this, due to maintaining little of the original energy. At low wave frequencies like that of visible light, electrons in glass is forced to vibrate at a low amplitude. The energy of the atom is kept for a short while before moving to corresponding atoms. The light is eventually emitted at the same frequency as it had when it moved into the opaque matter. The time delay that is caused by the time that it takes to absorb energy in one atom and be transferred to the next atom causes a decrease in speed at which light moves through the material. The moment the light moves out of the transparent object, it retakes the original velocity. Waves with a large wavelength, like ultraviolet rays, don't just make electrons vibrate inside the material, but entire molecules. The internal energy of the material increases and it heats up. Microwaves use this principle to heat up food. Water molecules inside the food is placed in resonance with the microwaves. Most objects around us are opaque. That means that they absorb light without re-emitting it. These type of objects heat up as their internal energy increases. Metals shine because the outside electrons move around, which means that they are not bound to a specific atom. Light waves then cause these electrons to vibrate because the electrons do not move from atom to atom, giving the metal a shiny appearance. There are small particles in the air, like smoke, dust and water damp. That means that light can sometimes even be seen from the side. Small particles in the air therefore disperses light in all directions. How much it's dispersed depends on the wavelength of the light and the size of the particles. The reason the sky is blue is because more blue and violet light is dispersed than any other color. Our eyes are not very sensitive for violet light, otherwise light would have been violet and not blue. Sometimes the sun is red in the afternoon. This is because the angle at which the light is dispersed allows more red light to pass through. Blue light, for example, has two times the frequency of red light. If a shiny surface like polished tin is inducted with a negative charge and ultraviolet light is shown on it, the charge will disappear once the light is shown on it. Ultraviolet light has the ability to push off electrons on certain materials. The emission of electrons from a metal on which ultraviolet light is shined is known as the photoelectric effect. In this circuit you see an arrangement of the observation of this effect. Light which is shown on the surface of a negatively charged photosensitive metal releases electrons which are attracted to a positively charged plate to deliver a measurable voltage. If the collector would just load enough negative potential to push off the electrons, the current can be stopped. The voltage needed to do this is called the discontinuation voltage. 
It's a measurement of the amount of kinetic energy which the electrons had when they were emitted. If all the emitted photoelectrons are sent over the collector, we say that the cell has reached saturation current. It will form on the point where the discontinuation voltage is. The tempo of emission depends on the intensity of the incursive light. The maximum kinetic energy of photoelectrons that are emitted are independent of the intensity of the incursive light. The maximum kinetic energy of the freed photoelectrons have a linear relationship to the frequency of the incursive light. The emission is immediate. There is a threshold at which no photoelectrons can be freed, irrespective of the brightness of the light. The maximum kinetic energy of photons don't depend on the brightness of the light. That means even if light has strong electromagnetic fields, it doesn't emit more photoelectrons. To understand this, you have to note that the energy of light is contained in small bodies called photons and that they are concentrated. Each photon can have its own amount of energy and this is called a quantum. The energy quantum depends on the energy of light, like Planck describes it. An electron on the surface of a metal will either accept this energy or not. The electron will immediately be emitted if it absorbed a photon's energy and will then leave the metal. It must then overcome attractional forces after it's left the metal. The attractional force depends on the type of metal and the labor function of the metal. If the electron cannot overcome this energy, it will fall back onto the metal. Before you, you see Einstein's photoelectric equation. It represents the maximum kinetic energy of an emitted photoelectron. If an electron has enough energy to overcome the labor function of a metal, we say that it has reached a threshold frequency. This is the frequency for which the kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectron is zero. Zero is therefore equal to hf less w. That means w equals hf at the threshold frequency. Energy is a lot of times represented as electron volts. This is because the photoelectric effect sometimes requires the amount of volts associated with photoelectrons. To change electron volts back to joules, we multiply the charge with that of one electron. One can get different colored flames if you burn different gases. And also in a fireworks show, light caused by a warm material can be sent through a prism to see which colors are present. That is called the emission spectrum. One can also use the emission spectrum to identify substances because it is like the fingerprint of that specific element. Calcium, for example, gives off a brick red color where copper gives a green color and so forth. Atoms emitting light is then generated. Gas-like substances can be generated in discharge tubes where high voltages is sent through to determine a gas. Light emitted through discharge tubes is sent through an apparatus called a spectroscope. It has a thin split which acts as a light source. The light enters a collimator which makes it parallel. It moves through a diffraction grid to identify colors inside the spectrum. A special lens is used and a photo can be taken of the gas to identify it. The angle at which light deviates can be measured. With the grid spacing and angle of light, the wavelength of light can be determined. Each component of color owns its own position in the spectrum depending on its wavelength and frequency and forms an image on the split. Different colored lines which you see is called the spectrum lines. Spectrums are classified in the following forms. Elements delivering a few lines are called line spectrums. Examples of this is hydrogen, helium, sodium and calcium, strontium and mercury. But there are a lot more examples. If there are a lot of lines and it looks like they are joining each other. It's called a band spectrum. A metal like thaladium is heated up until it glows. It for example gives off so many colors that it looks like the spectrum doesn't stop. 
but in reality there are millions of lines which cannot be seen separately. This is called a continuous spectrum. If light of a source like a heated thelanium glow wire, that's basically a bulb, sodium vapor, the sodium vapor absorbs its part of the spectrum and leaves black lines inside the continuous spectrum. These dark lines form an absorption spectrum. Spectrum lines come from the electrons surrounding atoms. Electrons also exist in energy levels around atoms. When an electron is awakened, it moves to a higher energy level. When it falls back to the original level, it gives off a photon light, which corresponds exactly with the changing energy level. Each element therefore has its own characteristic energy levels. The spectrum lines of an element therefore correspond with the energy jumps between energy levels. How lasers work are based on the stimulated awakening of light through awakening atoms. The word is a synonym for light intensification through a stimulated emission of beams. Einstein thought of lasers 40 years before they were built. With the right frequency, spontaneous emission can be achieved. This is when awakened atoms lose their energy by randomly going back to a previous energy level. They then give off light photons. With the right frequency, one can be able to emit light from these atoms. The process is called stimulated emission and takes place when the frequency of entering light is equal to the frequency of the transfer between the energy levels of the atoms. Some conditions should be met for a practical laser. It should firstly be an active medium. That means that it should contain atoms or molecules that can emit light. There should be a way to add energy to the active medium to stimulate enough atoms to the awakened condition. This is called pumping. Finally, there should be a way to keep in the light beam so that it didn't cause many stimulated releases before escaping the material. The beam is restricted in an optical resonator. This is an example of a helium neon laser. It contains 85% helium and 15% neon. At a low pressure in a small glass tube, a high voltage is introduced at the sides. The helium and neon atoms move to a heightened condition. The electrons then almost immediately fall back to their previous condition, except for one condition of helium. Helium has an enlonged inertia before it falls back, and this is called a metastable condition. That means that it takes quite a while, one millisecond, comparison to 10 nanoseconds, which the energy change normally takes. A large number of heightened helium atoms is then built up. These atoms then provide a source of energy for neon atoms which then causes the neon also to go into a metastable condition. This is called pumping. This process continues until there are more metastable atoms than when in the starting state. This is called population inversion. Some of the neon atoms start to emit red photons out of the light tube when they are in a metastable condition. These photons stimulate other awakened photons to fall back and they give off photons which is exactly in the same phase as the atoms stimulating their fallback. Photons moving in a parallel direction with the tube is mirrored across from mirror to mirror. This then produces a lot more photons which is in phase. The length of the tube is determined carefully so that it is as long as a whole number of half wavelengths so that the light undergoes constructive inference inside the hole and starts to resonate. The light beam is then in a sense strengthened. One of the mirrors partially reflect and some of the photons can escape through it. They all escape in phase, have the same frequency and move in the same direction. They therefore form the laser beam. 
In the figure, you see the energy levels of a helium neon laser. When the awakened neon atoms fall back, the wavelength directly corresponds to the energy produced. Laser light is monochromatic. It comprises of a single frequency, which doesn't spread out when it goes through a prism. It is coherent. A parallel beam will stay parallel, even if it moved across a large distance. Laser light is extremely thin. The broadness of the beam is determined by the size of the opening. The intensity of laser light is also very high. This is because the power within a beam is restricted to a very small area, which then gives a large force per unit area.